Alrighty, good evening everyone. Hope you're having a lovely Tuesday evening. I'm Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist, also a chiropractic physician at Gates Brain Health. And tonight I'm talking about PCOS, referring to polycystic ovarian syndrome, insulin, and the brain. And so if you have polycystic ovarian syndrome, this talk may be a benefit. Um, so anyways, uh, good evening to all of you who are joining. Good evening to the Facebook crowd. Again, Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist, also a chiropractic physician at Gates Brain Health. Why am I talking about PCOS? PCOS is an illness that has major ties to insulin, insulin resistance. So we have ties to dietary patterns gut bacterial polymorphisms or bacterial population dysmorphisms, a better way to say it, and, um, and how stress also affects hormones. I think we may go over a few topics tonight that are interesting, and so let me know what you think. So without further ado, I'm going to present from the beginning on this PowerPoint presentation. Okay. For all of you on Facebook, you can go to the YouTube Live and see the PowerPoint. So this is an illustration from, uh, and hello to everyone who's joining. This is an illustration from Cecil's Essentials of Medicine. It's an internal medicine book. Uh, it's just a nice diagram of the basics illustrating the ovarian physiology. Here you see in the left part of the diagram the growing follicle, referred to as the follicular phase. Then we have ovulation. When ovulation occurs, as you go down this diagram, you see that there's a temperature spike, as many people are aware of. There's also this production of luteinizing hormone. And associated with ovulation, we see there's a transition in the production of different hormones. So in the follicular phase, which is where this follicle is basically growing, estrogen or estradiol tends to crescendo and increase until ovulation, at which point it drops off precipitously. And then progesterone increases more in a, a gradual curvature, a, an extended bell-shaped curve, so to speak, and then progesterone goes down. As progesterone goes up, we have thickening of the uh, basically the endometrium, and when that happens, and then the egg is not fertilized, then we have a sharp drop in progesterone, which then leads to menses. So that is basic ovarian physiology. I think it's important to know because when we're talking about polycystic ovarian syndrome, we're talking about the ovaries, we're talking about cysts there, we're talking about abnormal hormonal production from the ovaries. So it's really good just to kind of basically understand how fertility works if you're going to look at that. It's also really important to understand how the brain works and its connections to uh, the hormonal system. So here is a diagram of the hypothalamus and the pituitary. This is from the Principles of Neuroscience. Uh, the fifth edition, and the, you have two parts to your pituitary. One is called the anterior pituitary, or the adenohypophysis, and then you have the posterior pituitary gland, referred to as the neurohypophysis. The anterior pituitary produces your hormones or chemical messengers that are going to go to your ovaries. So luteinizing hormone is produced from the anterior pituitary, so is follicle stimulating hormone. So going back up in the slide, uh, you can see here the LH spike, and you can see them demonstrating follicle stimulating hormone. So basically, those two hormones are produced from your pituitary gland are going to come down to your ovaries, telling your ovaries to do certain things. That's really important, as you'll see throughout the broadcast, regarding hormonal physiology and polycystic ovarian syndrome. So this is a great uh, article I found uh, titled Correlations of Insulin Resistance and Serum Testosterone Levels with LH to FSH Ratio and Oxidative Stress in Women with Functional Ovarian Hyperandrogenism. So a lot of big words there. I think it's important just to go over what is insulin resistance. Insulin is a hormone produced by our pancreas and it's going to take carbohydrates that come into the bloodstream, and it helps facilitate the absorption of carbohydrates into the cells of your body. 
uh, like muscle cells. And so if we have to produce more insulin for a given amount of carbohydrates, so think if you have one piece of toast and now you're having to produce 30% more insulin to get the carbohydrate from that toast into the cells of your body, then you are insulin resistant. As I talk about frequently, this insulin resistance, the newest science is showing, stems from abnormal absorption of toxin from the gut. Technically, it's called lipopolysaccharide. It's part of gram-negative bacteria. So this ex excessive absorption of toxin then results in this process of insulin resistance. Someone can be insulin resistant for 20 years. They may be resistant their whole life, but commonly there's an insulin resistant phase of 10 to 20 years before we go into frank diabetes. And this is a really, really important phenomena for polycystic ovarian syndrome because it appears that this insulin resistance is the underlying cause of the disrupted hormonal physiology. And hyperandrogenism basically means high testosterone. So here from this journal, Indian Journal of Clinical Biochemistry, as I was just reading, I have some highlighted portions, and I think it's, it's good that I read them to you. FOH, standing for functional ovarian hyperandrogenism, as is labeled here. Functional ovarian hyperandrogenism is an ovarian dysfunction caused by excess circulating levels of androgens, which inhibit folliculogenesis and lead to polyfollicular morphology. So basically, the high testosterone is intimately tied to basically not making the follicles in a normal fashion, and as a result, basically leads to an ovulatory infertility, which brings up our next point. So how do we diagnose polycystic ovarian syndrome? Polycystic ovarian syndrome is diagnosed based on the Rotterdam criteria, which says you have two of the three following. You have cysts on your ovaries. That's one of them. You have abnormal menstrual cycle lengths, i.e., you know, you go three months without a period. And or you have signs of high testosterone on blood tests, or you have the phenotypical features of high testosterone, meaning you're a female and you have facial hair growth, that you're having to wax or pluck, or you're getting chest hair growth. So those are signs of high testosterone. You only have to have two out of those three for it to basically qualify as polycystic ovarian syndrome, i.e. it's confusing for people who may not have been diagnosed as having cysts in their ovaries that they have polycystic ovarian syndrome. And in fact, an article came out in 2017 in the journal Fertility and Sterility where they uh, surveyed a bunch of OBGYN doctors and they found that like 30% of them weren't even aware of the Rotterdam criteria and were basically just diagnosing polycystic ovarian syndrome if someone had cysts on their ovaries, which is technically not correct. So I've heard of a lot of, I know I'm not an OBGYN, but I've heard of a lot of patient stories where, you know, the OBGYN says, well, unless you weigh X number of pounds, referring to an overweight number, and unless you have a beard, I'm not going to diagnose you as having polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is technically not accurate. And when you look at the data out of Europe, um, I cited an article, I think, uh, previously, where basically they found that around 20% of women fulfill the criteria for having polycystic ovarian syndrome, <clears throat> the Rotterdam criteria. And so uh, it's important to understand how we diagnose PCOS. And then going on, basically, you can see that this high testosterone, these high androgens, are what lead to the anovulatory infertility. They are also what lead to the hirsutism, which is the facial hair growth, acne, and male pattern alopecia, which basically means male pattern baldness. You'll see in polycystic ovarian syndrome a tendency for a female to lose her hair over the crown of the head, whereas with something like Hashimoto's thyroiditis, uh, one may lose hair from all areas of the head, or with Something like lupus, you'll lose like a clump of hair in one focal spot or over the entire head um, where someone goes completely bald. But basically, this male pattern alopecia is on the crown of the head and it's due to high testosterone. They said chronic LH stimulation. So LH, again, is that hormone that comes from your pituitary down to your ovaries. Men have it too, and it goes to their testicles. But in this situation, chronic LH stimulation and functional ovarian hyperandrogenism 
induces sustained hypersecretion of androgens by the theca compartment, that's theca cells of the ovary, probably augmented by insulin and insulin-like growth factor. So big statement there. In essence, what we've what we see in the literature regarding polycystic ovarian syndrome is that there's this phenomena of LH resistance. So we have all these resistances to hormones. So the ovaries become resistant to luteinizing hormones. So what happens? Then basically the pituitary starts hyperproducing luteinizing hormone. And when it does that in polycystic ovarian syndrome, unfortunately it doesn't lead to excessive production of estrogen. It leads to more production of androgen androgens, which is why a lot of PCOS patients get stuck in the cycle of they may be changing their diet, they may be trying to dietarily bring down their insulin levels, they continue to struggle with issues with their weight, they continue to struggle with issues with unwanted hair growth and irregular menses. And it's kind of like once the snowball gets rolling, it's really rolling. And that's what we can see here is that once this process starts, then the LH stimulation increases, producing more androgens, and we have the, you know, the vicious cycle, so to speak. And they go on to say insulin resistance, referred to here as IR, causes hyperandrogenism by activating the enzyme cytochrome P450 C17 alpha hydroxylase. <clears throat> this is really important. So a lot of you may be saying, well, how does insulin resistance at a tissue or biochemical level result in these changes in hormones? And what happens, I think this, I don't have a good diagram illustrating it, unfortunately. But what happens is that the insulin resistance activates this enzyme 17 alpha hydroxylase, which then causes more hormonal or prohormones to go down kind of a pipeline towards androgens and less towards estrogens. And this same enzyme is in the adrenal glands too, so that's important to know because your adrenal glands produce hormones like progesterone and can produce DHA, which leads to testosterone. So this insulin resistance activates an enzyme in the ovaries, which then leads to this excessive shunting of reserves into testosterone derivatives, referred to as androgens. And you can see here in this nice diagram the incidence of um, basically these different issues and functional ovarian hyperandrogenism, sorry it's late, is the most common situation, more than adrenal production of high androgens. Okay, this is a cool article, and I don't always cite articles from mice, but it's a cool article because it illustrates a point. Obesity-induced infertility. So basically they can take mice and they can induce obesity by feeding them high-fat, high-carbohydrate uh, chow, as it's referred to. Obesity-induced infertility and hyperandrogenism are corrected by deletion of the insulin receptor in the ovarian theca cell. And so if they go in and they genetically will delete the insulin receptor in the ovarian theca cell, they can see dramatic, or what they did see, were dramatic changes in hormonal physiology by doing this. So this diagram, and this is from, uh, what journal was this? Diabetes, 2014. So they took lean mice, they took mice who were insulin, and then they did this knockout of the insulin receptor, and they showed, and these mice who were obese, and they basically showed that when they did this, that all the effects of the high insulin on hormonal physiology and lots of androgens then self-corrected basically when they knocked out the insulin receptor. So insulin resistance insulin resistance is definitively tied to abnormal hormone production from the ovaries. So maybe it's good to pause there and just really emphasize this point because I see this a lot. I've, I've received comments through the years of really, uh, let me say this way, patients with polycystic ovarian syndrome who are trying very hard. They're going on a ketogenic based diet. They're going on the paleo based diet and they're frustrated because maybe they're only losing 10 pounds. Maybe they're doing cardio for an hour a day, and it just seems like their body is very resistant to them losing weight and is part of the insulin resistance. 
What I have seen in my experience is that it's tied to this endotoxin absorption from the gut. The literature is abound on this association. And this may be the explanation uh, for why an individual who is working really hard and changing their diet, why they just can't lose the weight they want to and why the insulin resistance may not be changing. Also, as I mentioned before, once this insulin resistance snowball starts, it changes hormonal physiology from the pituitary to the ovary, which can then be a reason why we develop this LH resistance and then hyperandrogenism, which just keeps this whole cycle going. Now, another really important factor that is not commonly discussed that I've seen in other videos or in research forums is the association between psychological stress and androgen production in PCOS patients. And this is a great article from Psychoneuroendocrinology in 2018, where they did this study with actually a pretty large sample size, looking at salivary cortisol and cortisone responses to short-term psychological stress. The stressor basically was going into an OBGYN's office, filling out some paperwork, and then having an examination. The net sum of this study, and here you can see the data collection and the number of people they had involved, the net of the study was that they basically found those with polycystic ovarian syndrome had dramatically amplified responses to stress. So they were much more stressed physiologically in this situation, and they produced a lot more cortisol and, I believe, DHEA as a consequence of this stress. So this was a big article illustrating that PCOS patients tend to be more stressed than non-PCOS patients, and when that occurs, that stress is not just stress. That stress is androgens and PCOS is a disease of androgens, so we want to reduce androgens. So stress management is really, really important, and I think it needs to be emphasized a lot more in the PCOS patient population. This is uh, another article um, where basically they said psychological distress is more prevalent in fertile age and premenopausal women with PCOS symptoms, a 15-year follow-up. Uh, so again, that's confirming what I just mentioned. What can PCOS patients do naturally? There's a lot of talk about inositol derivatives. So myonositol and dichironositol have been shown to improve hormonal production from the ovary. Um, these inositol derivatives seem to help ovarian hormonal physiology. And then this is the article I commonly cite from clinical endocrinology, where the use of berberine for women with polycystic ovarian syndrome undergoing IVF treatment uh, they showed that berberine outperformed a common diabetes medication, metformin, which is commonly used in PCOS patients, um, for producing more live bursts. Again, remember that polycystic ovarian syndrome is the most common cause of infertility. Number two is Hashimoto's thyroiditis or thyroid issues not allowing full-term bursts. And so if you know someone who struggles with fertility, maybe bring this discussion up to them, say, hey... Have you looked at the Rotterdam criteria for PCOS because their doctors may not be aware of it? Have you had your insulin checked? Have you had an oral glucose tolerance test? Have you had a hemoglobin A1C? What are your triglyceride levels? Because have you heard about endotoxemia, subclinical endotoxemia? Because these are the features that I've just seen that a lot of polycystic ovarian syndrome patients are not aware of. And because it involves you know, 20 and 30 year old patients oftentimes who are looking to start a family, this is important information to know. So that's the broadcast. Thank you all for joining, and I hope you have a good rest of your Tuesday evening, and I hope that you sleep well, and, uh, and yeah, okay. I will be back tomorrow.